Hey everyone, I would like to welcome you into NetLife with myself, of course, Dawn Staley. As a coach, is you, you have to deal with what's in front of you. And I, I, I do believe our players respond best to the task that's in front of them. And they actually are a, a group of uh, young ladies that are, are task oriented. And they just deal with what's in front of them, or that's all I see them do. Like, I never really hear them talk about the tournament. I don't really hear them talk about wanting to win a national championship besides very early on in the season we, when we discuss what, what our goals are and what we wanted to accomplish. Um, so just one game at a time at this point and just trying to trying to check off some goals. When we, when we are approaching something like a, an SEC tournament, which uh, we, we want to we wanna be there in the end, and you have to look at it from a coaching staff standpoint, um, the, the big picture. And the big picture is, is three games in a row if we're going to win it. So on the front end of it, we, we rest up. And then as we move through the week and get closer to the tournament – we, we, we do less as far as on the court. We do a little bit more in the film room because at this point it's, it's, it's less about, you know, working hard and getting out there on the court. Um, and we're cautious of making sure that we have everybody healthy. So it, it's more of just managing um, movement and managing stretching and managing, like, just active recovery. So we'll, you know, we'll probably do um, two days off this week. We'll get back at it on Wednesday. Um, we'll probably go for maybe an hour, no more than an hour and 15 minutes. We leave on Wednesday and then Thursday, we got 45 minutes at the arena that we play at. And then that's about it because we play at noon on Friday. So it's, it's balancing. Rest is equally as important as working out and, and probably more important at this stage of the game um, when you're talking about uh, winning an SEC tournament championship. I think what, you know, we are as, as an athlete, former athlete, as a coach that's been in it, this is my 22nd year, um, we are creatures of habit. And it doesn't mean that we can't pivot every now and then, but we try to keep it as close to what we've been all season long than not. And, and if something just so happens to – throw us off a little bit, like like take for instance, um, when we just played um, our final regular season game, there was a lot of activity prior to the tip where we, di we didn't really get our normal warm up time. So we got, <laughs> we got less warm up time, it wasn't our normal routine, so um, we basically got on the court, ran on the court, and then you know almost immediately had to go to the bench and then they did the starting lineups, and then we did our huddle. And I'm just like, I asked the team, was that our normal um, routine? And they were like, no. I said, well, um, then we're gonna be, uh, we're gonna be the habits that we formed already. So it wasn't our normal routine. So we gotta, we gotta deal with it, and it's, it's done. Now we just have to. Uh, do what we've done all season long, the way we start basketball games, the way we lock in and play defensively, the way we're linked together offensively. Those things don't change because you didn't get a chance to you know, warm up for the five minutes that you usually get the chance to warm up um, to prior to uh, the start of the game. We, we actually don't even talk about the number one ranking. I mean, we, I mean, I, seriously, I don't even hear, hear our players talk about that. They, they, they're, they just deal with what's in front of them. So if the day is Monday, they're just going to deal with Monday. They don't deal with uh, what time the polls come out or whether or not we're the number one team. They don't even worry about that. They've been the number one team before, so it's, it's really nothing new to them. What they haven't done is win a national championship. So um, obviously that's one of the things that they want to check off. So it's, it's not a it's not a – you know, a new occurrence for them. If it was our first time being the number one team in the country, you know, maybe. But even when we were with this particular team, they were like, oh, well, 
you know? Let's, let's just keep winning. So I, I like that space, and they allow me to just carry on. I mean, if it's nothing that needs to be said, you know, I don't, I don't say it. If it's nothing that needs to be done, I don't do it. I just allow them the space to enjoy where they are in this, you know, in this part of the season. Um, I, I say, um, as a, as a, as a player, I mean, you're just really locked into um, what your responsibility is to the team, and then as a coach, you're responsible for every individual um, player. Um, and staff members and coaches and just making sure we are a united front that we are in, we don't get in our own way that we just continue to keep the routine that we've had if you don't if you're not the one that that um I mean we're superstitious as well like like you know we walk in the arena a certain way meaning the coaching staff uh, we get off the bus a certain way. So if you're not the first one off the bus, then, you know, don't try it. <laughs> don't try it now that we're in postseason because, again, we are we are creatures of habit. We, we do things a certain way and then, you know, because that's, that's what we can control because there are, are going to be some other things that we can't control, but if we can control what we normally do, um, I'm good with that. So I, I'm a creature of habit and I, I like I – like, to stay in that that form, whether it's you know regular season or whether it's postseason. And, and one thing that we do say, you know, this entire season is keep the main thing, the main thing. And it's it's so simple um, because ultimately this team wants to win. So if we if we want to win, then we we have to prioritize. Um, and the priority is this team is first at this point. Like, it's we're first. We're postseason. We're first. So we'll be able to juggle everything that you need to juggle. Just keep your, your same academic routine. Keep your same practice routine. Keep your same day. Um, so let's not all of a sudden go out and want to, you know, want to party all night or, you know, want to choose choose someone else over over our team at this point. So... We simply just say keep the main thing the main thing, and it, it, it usually straightens everything out. Well, I mean, we're, we're going to enjoy the experience, of course. Like, we, we're we not just, like, you know, got our heads down. This is an experience. When we say you come to South Carolina, you really get the the ultimate uh, student-athlete experience. Um, we, we treat our team and our program like it's a, like it's a pro um, franchise. Um, we give them uh, rules and responsibilities to um, abide by. And if you're a rules follower, you, you have no issues. You know, you have no issues. I have no issues. If you're not a rule follower, we can't find them, but we certainly address it. But we've been fortunate to have a really responsible team. We got great leadership. Like great leadership, like it, Victoria Saxton and and Aaliyah Boston are both um, young women who, if they were not like captains of our basketball team, you know, they could be CEOs of uh, Fortune 500 companies because they are they get it, you know, they get it, they see the big picture, and they're unafraid to address anything that doesn't look like it's appropriate for. Whatever, whatever the situation calls for. So I, I, I really love that about them because obviously they make my job a lot easier because of how they lead. I mean, to, to win an SEC tournament, it would mean that uh, uh, we, we, we have a pretty great stretch in winning at, 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 you know, in this conference. I mean, our conference is a really tough conference, probably the best conference top to bottom. Um, in the in the country, um, and if you if you can win an SEC tournament championship, well, guess what, you you can win a national championship. So it would mean that we put ourselves in in great company and and, and being um, a team that's won it a, a lot. But it also means the next step that the competitiveness of uh, our tournament will lead us into 
um, what it would take to win a national championship. This week's episode is exciting. I have two really special guests. The interviews were recorded separately, and while we try to keep things as up-to-date as possible, we recorded both interviews a little while ago, so we don't talk about some of the current geopolitical events, like Russia's invasion of Ukraine and its impact on the world, or President Joe Biden making the historical choice to nominate Katanji Brown Jackson to the Supreme Court of the United States. It's not that I don't find those events to be important and worth discussing with my guests who are in the political realm. They just hadn't occurred when I sat down with them. But before we get to those interviews, hold tight because we have to take a quick break and hear from one of our partners. I'm excited. It's March which means the Paralympics are here. To prepare, I've been listening to Flame Bear's podcast and their episodes that highlight incredible Paralympians. One of the recent episodes of Flame Bear's highlights Oksana Abdi-Karmova from Russia, who is a biathlon Paralympian. Here's a quick clip from an episode where we hear a little more about how excited and nervous she was to compete in her home country in 2014. The airplane landed. And I realized that it's that's it. And uh, in my um, in my ears was that you know that song, but wake me up when it's all over, because I'm so uh, nervous and all that stuff. Then we get to the hotel, and I was with my roommate and teammate uh, Natalia, and I said, "Do you believe that we are here and we are our first Olympic Games?" My first race wasn't good. It was biathlon, 6K, and I did four missions. And it's awful because all that season before, I was zero. And then I was crying because it's the first time and I was nervous. And my parents were there, my father was there, and he, he yelled, Hey, I'm here. Hey, honey. <laughs> Throughout Oksana's episode, she sheds light on the invisibility of disability in Russia, how it has evolved and how it hasn't over the past 30 years. She is a role model for other Paralympians and disabled athletes and is always looking for ways to inspire local youth with disabilities who are beginning to compete in her sport. Listen to Oksana's full episode on Flame Bearers wherever you get your podcasts. The Beijing Paralympics are finally here. While you watch as athletes compete, hear their stories. Listen to top women athletes share their trials and triumphs on the Flame Bears podcast. Stay tuned for more and what's ahead on Flame Bears season two. What's the best workout program? The one that is custom built just for you. Future is the new workout experience that pairs you one-on-one -on -one with your own fitness coach. Your coach will map out a plan based on your goals with workouts delivered to your phone each week. Future, your Apple Watch and the app all pair seamlessly so you and your coach can track your progress, celebrate achievements, and keep you accountable every day. Get started right now with 50% off your first three months at tryfuture.com slash netlife. My listeners should all know my guest this week, Bill Clinton, was the commander-in-chief from 1993 to 2001. In addition to being the 42nd president of the United States, he's an author, an attorney, a philanthropist, and a teacher, and hosts his own podcast, why am I telling you this on iHeartRadio? Mr. President, thank you for joining NetLife. I'm glad to do it. I'm, uh, I'm always glad to be with you. I might learn something. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're going we're gonna to jump right in because I know, you know you're a busy man, but really appreciate you, you taking just a, you know, just a few minutes to, to share in, in my growth and learning 
and, and growing because we're always in that place of learning and growing. So in sports, something that we've seen become more and more prevalent is watching athletes use their platforms to speak out about politics and social justice issues. In your presidency, athletes weren't as outspoken about politics. Why do you think that has changed in the last 20 years? I think more and more <clears throat> athletes realize that they're also citizens, they're parents, they're, they're people who have a stake in making a world that is good for everybody to live in. I think that's a really good thing. I, I did have some help uh, that I very much appreciate when I was uh, running uh, in 1992. That was a long time ago, 30 years ago, and um, Magic Johnson came out for me because of my outspoken support for doing something about AIDS. And he made a real impact on people just because he didn't run away from it, he didn't shy away from it, he took the whole issue out on the right day and explained it. Uh, and as he reminded me to his last day on earth, Hank Aaron was probably personally <laughs> responsible for my being the last Democrat to win in Georgia before President Biden did. We had a rally at a high school gym on the football field. We filled the football stadium the weekend before the election just outside of Atlanta, and there were 25,000 people there, and I carried the state by 13,000. So for the rest of my life, or my friendship with Hank Aaron, which continued until he passed a couple of years ago, he, he would tell anybody that, you know, I made that guy president. <laughs> <laughs> but, and then I think, you know, I saw a People getting more involved. Billie Jean King had a lot to do with, I think, women wanting to be more involved in public issues. And then uh, one of my most memorable nights in Los Angeles was a night with uh, Kobe Bryant and his wife when the, they were part of dedicating a, a new housing development downtown, really nice place for people who were homeless and many of whom had mental health issues and needed care there. So I've seen this build up, you know, over a long period of time. And I think it's, you know, athletes are people too. And they don't want to, they obviously they want to have supporters that are members of both parties or believe different things. But if you believe something and you think it affects the quality of your <clears throat> children's future or the people and issues you care about, I think it's a good thing to speak out. So President Clinton, if you were running for office today, what female athlete would uh, you want their endorsement? Oh, yours. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, wait, wait, wait. Well, let thank, me... You got that. You, 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 had it, you had it, you know, back in 92 um, to this day. So I, I appreciate our, our friendship and, and I, I, I would certainly would be on the, on the front line Getting but, you back in the office. Let, let me tell you why I said that. I, you know, there's all kinds of women athletes that I love uh, watching women basketball players. I love watching women golfers. I watch a lot of uh, golf on the Golf Channel. It's interesting. I like that. But I wanted. I like it when uh, basketball coaches endorse me. <laughs> I, I, I didn't have that many when I was running before, but I had a couple that were important. And the reason I like it is that it's a team sport and that even if you have the greatest player in America, it can hurt you if you lose them, as we found in Connecticut this year, right? But mm -hmm. Connecticut kept being a pretty good team, and they're hanging around the top ten. It wasn't like they collapsed. I think basketball teaches people to think about uh, common endeavors. And so... I'm, I was serious about that when I said I'd pick you because you have proved what people can do together. Well, thank you. Well, you are a, a famous girl dad, an advocate for, for women's rights. Um, were, were there lessons that you saw Chelsea learn from sports that she carried throughout her life? Oh, yeah. I did. First of all, my, 
My f- first sport Chelsea played as a little girl was soccer, and mm-hmm. we had it was just beginning to take hold in the South, and so she played on a team that had boys and girls on it. Then, and when she was uh, in middle school, she started playing volleyball, and she she played on a team that was almost all black. She was in, you know, one of our public schools, and she thought she had really scored when they named her the most improved player on the team. She (laughs) said, Dad, I think that's a mixed blessing. But she became, um, ironically, she became a better athlete when she started taking ballet. And she still runs, and at 41 with three children, she ran her first marathon this year. Oh, wow. And she got injured, not in training, about a month before the marathon. I couldn't think there was any way. She was going around, you know, and kind of with a boot on her leg, and I didn't think there was any way she could run. And she said, oh, I'm going to run it. I just won't be able to run it in under four hours now. <laughs> and I knew what would happen. It got She got out there and got all pumped up, and she ran it in under four hours, which to be your first marathon and at 41 was pretty good. So she's a pretty good athlete, my daughter. Mm-hmm. What was it like being the president and watching your daughter play sports or be on the stage? It was just like being any other dad. Mm-hmm. I think, you know, when, when she was on a softball team, which she loved, it was sponsored by a local dentist office when I was governor. They were called the Molar Rollers. <laughs> <laughs> and I would, I'd go out there, I'd get so wrapped up in the game, I was, you know, I thought they were going to have to cart me off for bad conduct. But I, I, I really... I think, you know, when your kid is the center of your attention doing something, it's just like any other parent. I, I love that. I love going to her ballet recitals, to play she did, anything. I, you know, it was a, a – I always told her it, that until she left the house, <clears throat> didn't matter if I was president, being her father I thought was my most important job. That's awesome. So you, as the president, you have to be uh, the the very best at cart part mentalizing. Like you yeah. were the president, but you're at Chelsea's game or or ballet recital. How 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 were you able to just cart part mentalize and just be present while while knowing that you had so many other things that you were responsible for, like 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 our country. <laughs> well, and you know. Some would say it's a form of mental illness being able to compartmentalize as much as I had to, but <laughs> I, I just tried to be present in the moment. And it is hard. And one of the things that always sort of surprised me, because I've always had a pretty good memory, uh, is when I read the oral histories, for example, of my running for president by the young people that work with me, I was amazed at things I didn't know or didn't remember that I'd actually lived through. Uh, but I remember going to her plays, her recitals, all of those things. I remember that. And you just have to be in the moment, you know, and you have to realize that whatever your job is, unless the country's at war, uh, it's not going to kill anybody if you take an hour or two just to be a father. Mm-hmm. Well, Al Davis, the owner of the Las Vegas Aces, recently signed Becky Hammond to the first ever WNBA million dollar coach's contract. What do you think about his commitment to the women's game? I think that was a good thing to do. I think the, uh, the athletes, uh, the soccer players, for example, all the others who have raised these equal pay issues are, are are good and are trying to get the salaries up. Now, I also think, though, it shows you that women's basketball is attracting more viewers on television, people are more interested in it, and you can afford to do it. And what you don't want to do is uh, you wouldn't want <clears throat> to bankrupt any of these people that are bankrolling teams that we need to get this, this sport bigger and bigger and bigger 
but you don't want them to take unjust rewards by not paying the people more because they think the pay scale's too low. The pay scales get widened when everybody decides to do it, and that's a good thing. I'm, I was thrilled. And I, by the way, I, just from observing her, I'm not an expert. Looks to me like she's worth it. <laughs> <laughs> she she absolutely is. Leadership is a big part of my podcast, and you were once the leader of the free world. What is the most important characteristic of a successful leader? Being credible to the people you're trying to lead. And then being pugnacious, <laughs> concentrated, <laughs> relentless in pursuit of whatever your goal is. But I think, you know, if you want people to follow you, uh, they have to want to. Oh, there are plenty of people who lead by fear and lead by, you know, bringing people down. But by and large, over the long run, it's pretty difficult. Even in it, uh, more authoritarian societies, it's pretty difficult to lead people whose heart's not in it. And so I think you got to be credible. People have got to believe that you believe what you're saying, that you believe what you're doing. And then the second most important thing, I think, is in realizing you don't reach everybody in the same way. People perceive things differently, and you have to have a almost eerie sense of how you're, if you're on a, for example, coaching a team, I think what the strengths and weaknesses and different perceptions are of the different people you're communicating with. You have to be you have to find a language that actually reaches people so that whatever you think you've got to offer, you can impart. Because you, um, you can't make people do many things. In the end, they have to want to, you know? Yep, I do. I, I, I just had uh, General Marty Dempsey on the podcast, and I asked him a similar question, and he said... Uh, Leaders have to be sense makers. And I, I just thought that was, you know, incredibly simple, but, you know, it, it's super powerful. Like, you got to make people, you got to make things make sense to people because we live in a complicated world. And if leaders can make sense of things um, and put a different perspective out there, it, it might it might bring us together. So... Um, I, I took that from from it, and I, I, I'm writing down what you're saying as well because I, I in turn, want to be a better leader. I want to be um, someone that uh, is a sense maker. When I look at you on television in a game, <laughs> I don't have any doubt that the people that play for you know that you would never ask them to do something you wouldn't do and know that you care every bit as much as they do. And it's so obvious that if I didn't know a thing about basketball, if I just watched it on TV without even the, the sound on, I would say, boy, that's a team I'd like to be on. <laughs> well, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, bef before we end, I have to ask about two topics that really fascinate me. Like, like it is Air Force One. Yeah. And secret service, like, like my, um, my bucket list, and I don't know if I'm gonna ever get it done. Is I would like to tour Air Force One. Now we we do have a um, a Boeing plant here, uh, in in Charleston, South Carolina. So I I do know some people that's pretty close to it. So I'm, I I put the ask out there. But what was it like boarding Air Force One for the first time? as president? It was great <laughs> because it, for several reasons. First of all, it's, it's a fascinating floating office. So there was a, you know, there's a big conference room in there and then the, uh, the president has a cabin. The first of, part of it is an office with a desk and a television and you know, and plenty of seats for people to have smaller meetings. And then there's a bedroom, which is a big double bed and 
You can read on it, read at night, with light reading lights and stuff. It's super nice, but it's also uh, a communal place. I loved not just me having meetings, work meetings in Air Force One, but but playing games in that big room with a lot of our people. We could play have six people playing cards, and <laughs> it just was great. I love the staff. There are two kitchens on Air Force One. One's mm. up front, one's in the back, and, and you know that was good. I, it was it was perfect. I could go walk in the in the press section where they were all flying with me, and they could ask their questions or whatever. But then if I needed to get away, I could just ease away. <laughs> <laughs> but I liked it, and I think they always liked it. I think the members of the press corps like traveling on Air Force One. It's a, and. Then we, I liked it because it's big enough that you actually have a whole separate community. For example, the staff and the press fell in love with Fargo, the movie. You remember Fargo? I do. And and they fell in love with There's Something About Mary, which is sort of a zany movie. <laughs> and the, and they would compete with each other. They watched it so many times on so many strips <laughs> of saying the lines, the next lines in the dialogue first. But I have all these great memories, and, and, and believe it or not, I still hear from people who were on the crew of their first one. You, mm-hmm. you, you get attached to people that, yep. you know, go through things with you, and sometimes you're going to a very happy destination. Sometimes you're going to a, a sad thing to commemorate people's losing their, people losing their lives. Sometimes, mm-hmm. you know, you're going to meetings because... It's what's necessary to hold the world together. I mean, it's, it's fascinating. Right. I loved it. I watched a documentary on on uh, Air Force One. There are two, like two of the the same exact plane. That's right. Um, and I mean, I mean, I, I even had like a a, um, a model, like a I put a, a model Air Force One plane together. Somebody gave me for Christmas, so that was pretty cool. We got a little bit time left so can you play this net life shot clock game for me as we end this podcast and basically we put 20 seconds on the shot clock and you answer as many questions as you can oh here i am all right (laughs) favorite moment when the championship team visited you at the white house i think when i went jogging with the 1996 women's basketball team yes yes um what is your first memory of watching women's sports um watching women play golf when we got a television set and then watching college basketball. I really got into it uh, before I ever came to Washington. I, uh, the the battle between Pat Summit and Gino Oriema at, at Tennessee and Connecticut, it was, it made me interested in women's basketball. That's awesome. Your, your proudest athletic moment? Uh, I was I sort of dunked the ball when I was 16 years old, and I was only six two, but I was much more limber than I am now. <laughs> and uh, I think that plus uh, the first the hole in one I had in Chicago, the first time I broke 80 uh, <laughs> on the Coronado course in San Diego. I think those were my proudest moments. Okay. Favorite podcast guest? Hint, hint. <laughs> uh, you mean present company excluded? Uh, <laughs> yes. yes. That, that's, that's very difficult, but I, I will say I loved, I've done Wynton Marsalis, who is a, the only person I think in the world, except Yo-Yo Ma, who's the best in, his, in more than one genre of music. Uh, and he's a from New Orleans and a culture I know pretty well, and so I love that. And I love Shonda Rhimes because she okay. is she created all these stories for all the rest of us to revel in, it's totally out of her own imagination, starting from a place where it was inconceivable that she would have wound up where she did. So I really liked them for those two reasons. Okay. And the last one is favorite Air Force One memory. Oh, that's really hard. There were so many, but I, this may sound funny, but we hit an air pocket on Air Force One once, and we dropped 100 feet. 
and we were all going to have uh, Mexican food, which was my favorite dish they made for me. And it was all over the kitchen, <laughs> in both of the kitchens, front and back. And I remember it because the entire crew was unflappable, said, we'll clean out the kitchen and feed you. Everything's going to be fine. In other words, nobody panicked and nobody showed any tension. And they've put a, a, there's still a lot of bare knuckle flyers out there, you know, who are a little scared <laughs> in airplanes. And I just watched them and how they said, you know, this is supposed to be a place where the White House is present, no matter what's happening. And, and I just, I never will get over how they, how they did it. Now we had lots of birthday parties and lots of, we lots, watched a lot of important sports events. We watched great movies and, you know, I have great memories of, but when I saw the way they reacted to adversity immediately, and I mean, it was a big drop. I mean, it, and it just shocked everybody because you think of it as such a big secure plane. How can anything that big just drop out of the sky? But it, it was great. Well, that's awesome. Um, on this podcast, I'm talking leadership, disruptors, change makers, it's hoops, it's politics, it's pop culture. It's the net sum of life. So before I let you go, I ask all my guests for some words of wisdom that either they receive that helps guide them or they want to pass along to others. President Clinton, what words of wisdom do you have to share? Never disempower yourself. You know, I, uh, I was with the last thing John Lewis and I did in a public setting was a, a Clinton Global Initiative for University Students out at the University of California at Berkeley. And the uh, students were there, all the universities, and they asked me for advice. And I said, you know, there's so many people who think that that somehow there's a magic formula and that's not about being themselves and being authentic. And I just said, the main thing is don't get in your way. We all get in our way in life. Every one of us did. Mm -hmm. And we, we just have to realize that life is short. It's fleeting. You have to decide what matters to you. You have to decide what you want to do. Most people are best at doing something that they love. And then just get out there and don't disempower yourself. If you lose, get up off the floor. If you win, be humble. Go on. And I think that's the people that last a long time did that. I watched Mandela uh, both when we served together and then in all the years afterward until he died. In every single encounter, his power from, came from being other directed. He was always trying to lift somebody else up. He was never. He never wanted anybody to talk about how he'd been in prison for 27 years and overcome all that abuse and everything that happened to him. He used, he knew what people thought, and he thought the way I can best be a leader is to maximize this moment to lift other people up. And you don't, he didn't do it by talking about himself. He did it by lifting other people up. And I, I think not disempowering yourself. It, you should think every day, well, Bad things will happen on some days, and you know you may face a health emergency, you may face a crisis at work. Uh, you may handle it well, you may not, but whatever you do, don't take yourself out of the game, by, and that's what you do if you disempower yourself. Maximize what you have and give it the best shot, and you, you won't win every day, every time, but you'll do 100 times better than you would otherwise do. Exactly, and, th and th I got a chance to visit uh, Nelson Mandela's resident because of you and our trip uh, yeah. to Africa. So, so thank you so much. I, I had to throw that in there. I, I still uh, revel about um, being on that trip with you and seeing. It was great. Seeing, wasn't it? It, it was. It was awesome. I teared up. I told. I teared up because I heard someone, a, a deaf person, here for the first time. Yep. And it was. It was amazing. Like, I still keep that with me. So thank you for, for giving me lifetime memories. Um, 
of, of visiting um, 10 cities in, in, in Africa. So thank you, President Clinton. Appreciate you coming on. Do you have anything you want to plug or promote before we leave? No, just I, I, I want to ask people to stay active, though. Be active citizens. And do not become cynical. We're going through unprecedented times. And this COVID's done weird things to our head, I think. You know, we all want it to be over, but we still got to do what we can to make it go away. And um, I could do a whole show on COVID because we, you know, I have a big, as you know, you've been seen it. I, mm -hmm. I, we, have, we have a big health presence. And in 20 African countries, we were asked to organize the COVID response. And, and uh, my health access initiative uh, went to the World Health Organization to try to help the Ethiopian who chairs it, Dr. Tedros, prepare to do better than they did against Ebola, and they have. But the point is, we are naturally conditioned to have a beginning, middle, and an end to every story. And we know in advance, like you know when you start a basketball game, how long it's going to be unless there's an overtime. And I once saw, a, whatever, a six or seven overtime game uh, between UConn and Syracuse in the Big East mm -hmm. tournament. Yeah. And you remember that? I do. And uh, it was unbelievable. Now, that was so exciting, nobody seemed to care, but I think the players were beginning to care. <laughs> and so when things get almost out of time, where you can't predict things, it's disorienting. And it's really, you know, people working away from home. Should they come back to uh, working at home? Should they come back to work? What will work look like? How long should I stay in this job? There's so many jobs available. Should I just go ahead and quit this one now? I mean, there's a lot of uncertainty now. And I think it's, we shouldn't aggravate the uncertainty by doing either dumb stuff or doing things that are self-defeating. We need to, we're going to have to crawl our way out of this together. And if we learn something from it, we'll do a little bit better in our tomorrows. Thank you, Mr. President. We, we, we really miss your leadership. <laughs> Thank you. I loved it. It's always good to be with you. Thank you. I'm excited to share more about Flame Bearers, one of my new favorite podcasts on Flame Bearers, top women Olympic and Paralympic athletes from around the world, like USA Soccer's Becky Sauerbrunn and Nigerian hoop star Azene Kalu Phelps, share their rarely heard stories and their full selves. Hear directly from the masters of grit and resilient to learn more about the issues that matter most to them and how they've been able to overcome obstacle after obstacle. Season two is live now, and Flame Bearers is spotlighting the women athletes blazing a trail to Beijing, including U.S. figure skater Brady Tennell, ROC's Oksana Abdekarmanmova, and many more. When you watch them compete in February and March, you'll see what they've worked so hard to achieve. But first, hear from them what happens when the cameras are off and stadiums are silent. During these challenging times, these women are an endless source of hope and inspiration. Our next partner has a product I use literally every day. I started taking Athletic Greens because I had to see what all the hype was about with so many athletes already using the product. With one delicious scoop of Athletic Greens, you're absorbing 75 high quality vitamins, minerals, whole food sourced superfoods, probiotics, and adaptogens to help you start your day right. This special blend of ingredients supports your gut health, your nervous system, your immune system, your energy, recovery, focus, and aging, all the things. Athletic Greens, are now part of my morning. I wake up, pour a scoop in my glass of water, and I'm on with my busy mornings. It's convenient, quick, and since I started, I felt more energized throughout my entire day. 
The travel packs also have made it easier to keep my routine, even when I'm on the road. Right now, it's time to prioritize your health and arm your immune system with convenient daily nutrition. It's just one scoop and a cup of water every day. That's it. No need for a million different pills and supplements to look out for your health. I love the peace of mind it gives me. To make it, to make easy, it easy, Athletic, Athletic Green. Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash net. Again, that's athleticgreens.com slash N-E-T to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. What's the best workout program? The one that is custom built just for you. Future is the new workout experience that pairs you one-on-one with your own fitness coach. Your coach will map out a plan based on your goals with workouts delivered to your phone each week. Future, your Apple Watch and the app all pair seamlessly so you and your coach can track your progress, celebrate achievements, and keep you accountable every day. Get started right now with 50% off your first three months at tryfuture.com slash netlife. Have you ever heard of recovery footwear or active recovery? I had neither until a fellow coach gifted me a pair of UFOs. And let me tell you, they have become my habit. I keep a pair everywhere, at home, in my office, in my locker, everywhere. As a former athlete, I still work out. It's tough to turn that off, but I also have to get my boy champ his exercise. And of course, coaching is super active. So I'm constantly on the move. My UFOs help me feel so much better throughout the day, no matter how much I have going on. UFOs uses a unique foam material called UFOM TM that absorbs impact so your body doesn't have to. You know, the journey that leads you to success is filled with adversity that can knock you off your path. But the resilience to sustain that success starts with active recovery and UFOs. Check out all the different styles, each with the same foam technology and footbed on UFOs.com. They changed my life and I think they could do the same for you. Osa mimosas are a drink I recently discovered. Their canned mimosas come in four delicious flavors like classic orange, peach bellini, mango, and my personal favorite, cranberry mimosa. They're made with premium sparkling wine, 100% real fruit juice, and contain 80% less sugar and 60% fewer calories than typical mimosas. But the best part is they're always ready to go, which means zero prep and most importantly, zero mess. Right now, Osa is partnering with NetLife to give our listeners a free four-pack of their best-selling classic mimosas with any purchase over $29. Simply add items to your cart, and they'll automatically add a free four-pack to your order once your cart reaches $29 or more. Do yourself a favor and grab some delicious mimosas at osamimosas.com slash J-W-S. That's O H. Z-A, mimosas.com slash J-W-S. I also was fortunate enough to catch up with another major player in Washington politics who is also very familiar with the college sports landscape. Welcome back and welcome to my guest, a former college basketball and football player at Duke University who went on to work for Obama as his deputy political director and then personal assistant. He's worked in sports, finance, media, politics, and is a published author and sits on the boards of multiple organizations. There doesn't seem to be anything he can do. Reggie Love, welcome to NetLife, and thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. Reggie, we got we got a lot of topics that I want to cover, but first we're just going to delve into uh, how do you – Go from a football scholarship at Duke to walking on to the basketball team and ending up both team captain and winning the NCAA title. I mean, I, I say that that was the first deal I ever cut in life. Um, 
you know, uh, Carl Franks was the head football coach at the time. And he said to me that, uh, look, if you're good enough to play Duke basketball, he said, feel free, go ahead. And I think, you know, a lot of guys that come to Duke to play football think they are good enough to play Duke basketball. Uh, you know, I, <laughs> you know, I, I grew up, uh, in North Carolina and, uh, played um uh for an AAU basketball team uh car- called the Charlotte Royals and we played against a bunch of the kids you know um Scooter Cheryl uh Steve Blake Travis Watson uh uh Michael Bell Juan Dixon and we played all against all these guys growing up and so like I you know I not to say that I was as good as those guys but I knew that I I could compete right I thought I, w- I was good enough to at least be on the court and uh and luckily enough, um, you know, when I got to school, I, my grades were okay. I wasn't academically ineligible and people felt like I could do the work. And, and then lo and behold, Carlos Boozer, you know, breaks his foot um, like two weeks before the, the ACC tournament. And I go from being just like a walk on to being a guy who's like now, you know, 18 years old and the seventh man in the rotation of a team that's got like five guys that go on to be, you know, 10 plus NBA veterans, 10 plus year NBA veterans. <laughs> that's, that's pretty cool. But, but, but Coach K, how did, how did, uh, you know, he, he needs, he's a legend. He needs no introduction. But what was it like playing for him? What was it like to convince him? Did you actually, did you go through the assistant coaches did you actually go in and sit in his office and say, hey, Coach K, I, I can help you. <laughs> I can help you with it. I can help you win. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, at the time, Johnny Dawkins was one of the assistants, and I had sent my tape, you know, my, you know, my high school. This is, when v- this is a VHS tape, not like a, a file. Right. Like, it was like literally a tape with the school, <laughs> you know, and uh, sent it to Johnny. And then when I came to my, for my visit, you know, Johnny brought me in and said, "Hey, look, you know, we'd love to to give you a chance to, to try to to try to, uh, to try to to play here." And so, um, and I remember when the season ended, I kind of you know went over and said, "Well, what do you think I should do?" When the basketball when the football season ended, I said, "What do you think I should do?" And he said, "Well, look, you know, make sure this is what you still want to do." He said. Well, when we get back from our little Thanksgiving tournament, you know, if you still have the energy, you know, love to have you at practice the, uh, that following day. And so, uh, so uh, I did, and I, I, I never looked back. Um, and, and I got to say, even though Duke basketball was amazing, you know, and I tell this to everyone, I, Duke football, I learned more about myself and I learned more about the people that I played Duke football with than I, than I did uh, playing Duke basketball because it's like, I mean, and you're probably going through this right now, you know, like when you're winning and like everyone's telling you you're good and you're tall and you're funny and you're good looking, you know, it's like easy to show up and like do the work uh, when things are, when things are good, man, it's hard to, you really learn a lot about yourself and you learn about the people in the trenches with when like, you know, when, when you've lost 11 consecutive games in 11 game season and your school papers telling you, Hey man, uh, new uniform, same crappy Duke football, you know, like when, 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 uh, when no one else out there has your back and you got to go out there and, and compete and prepare as though none of those things matter. Uh, I, I think you learn a lot about yourself and you learn a lot about, uh, the people around you. Oh, and 11. What is a coach? What, what is, uh, what's practice like? What is like post game speeches? What are they, what is that like? I mean, look, man. The, my my freshman year, it was a it was a dark year. I mean, we set a lot of records that were not records that you ever want to be associated with. You know, <laughs> total turnovers, total interceptions, total yards given up, total points scored against in a quarter. I mean, it was like uh, it, it was uh, not easy to say the say the, the the least. But I will say that you know. Every week, people showed up, you know, it, with this, this resolve that, you know what, next week is the week that we might make, the, we might turn the ship around here, man. Because, like, when it comes down to it, mm-hmm. it's like, 
it's Division One athletics. You know, everyone has some talent. And, you know, no one has a lock on winning. Everyone's got to compete to win. Everyone's got to put in the work. I mean, you, you've seen it uh, where these teams that have no business winning win games. And, and I think that's what makes the game amazing. And I think that's, you know, the kind of hopefulness that you need when you're that age to, to show up and compete when, when, when you lose 11 straight games. Okay. So this is a little bit different topic. I, I know it, you know, y'all were 0 and 11, right? Um, college sports nowadays, they got the, the NIL. What's your stance on these student athletes getting paid to, to play or just, just creating a brand and getting paid for their, for their brand? Yeah, I mean, look, I, I'd say, I mean, I've been saying this to Mark Emmerich for the last decade that, you know, when it comes down to the agreement between a university and a student athlete, for me, it's about, it's about uh, the opportunity to learn in, uh, uh, as a trade for my ability to play. And, you know, and I fundamentally believe that historically before NIL was passed, you know, it was not necessarily affirm that those things were aligned, you know, like, and no offense to coaches, right. But like, you know, if I'm a coach, I got my contract coming up and you know what, like ain't nowhere in my contract saying, Hey, and by the way, if the seventh person on your roster completes their, you know, uh, math class with a 2.5 GPA, you're going to get a bonus. They're like, not, not Don, you got to win. <laughs> and like, and that's not, it's like across the board, right? And so as, as long as the compensation for coaches is correlated with performance, you're never going to have true alignment between uh, a student athlete's opportunity to effectively uh, access all of the academic value that a university has to offer if they're not allowed to spend times outside of the season and outside of their playing career, you know, participating in that academic value, right? So, like, if I play four years as a Gamecock and I go play overseas or I go play in the league for five years, you know, I should be able to come back and play. I should be able to come back and get a master's degree in business or get a, you know, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, a degree in public policy or something that might help me you know, launched me into my second career. Um, you know, I think that that is like a big opportunity shift. Um, I think name, image, and likeness is good. Um, I think students do create a lot of value for the university, but I think that, I think what really student athletes need is they, they need, um, they need information, they need training, and they need to understand that this process is not about today. It's about the next 40 years of their life. Um, and, and so, you know, I, I hope, and, you know, look, I, I'm an investor in a couple platforms that are focused on some of these things. And, you know, I, I hope that the education piece of it comes, uh, comes to bear with it because I don't think that a hundred thousand dollars is going to make the difference. Uh, if it if it doesn't come with the right amount of education and the and the right amount of support uh, when when you're that when someone's that age, so that was really simply said and powerful. What what does Mark Embert say to that? Like what is his you know? And I know it's probably the whole you know this is amateur sport type of thing, but what does he what did he say to that? I mean, his response is like, oh well, I can't impose that upon all my members right like every member has their own challenges <sighs> right but like i would i mean and i didn't say this to him in recent years but like if we just saw this pandemic right and we just saw you know a couple million students across the country take courses online um you know my assumption is that there's tons of excess capacity uh that could be opened up for student athletes post competition um, without having a huge impact on the uh, academic process on a collegiate campus. Um, but like, look, I think that, um, 
I, I think that it's <clears throat> it, it is a it's a hard concept because I think sometimes people believe that that when people come to the university and they don't get a, an education or they don't get a degree, it's because they didn't want it. And I often say that you know you truly don't understand the, the psychology of what it is to be you know someone who's 17 years old, 18 years old, 19 years old competing you know, at the highest level, you know, I think, you know, to, for someone to be focused on one thing at one moment doesn't mean that, you know, two years from now, four years from now, that they won't want to have a focus on something that uh, is more aligned with uh, the collegiate educational experience. Cool. So we're going to change subjects a little bit and talk a little bit about your, I mean, your, your education. Why, why did you choose to study political science and uh, public policy? <laughs> Man, I gotta tell you the answer. Yeah, how does how does one? Yeah, <laughs> it's a bad answer, Sorry, man. Well, how does one? Okay, go ahead. <laughs> we like bad answers. <laughs> man, I got I I walked into my. Uh, you know, you have to determine your major after your sophomore year, and my got my counselor. I asked my counselor. I said, "Well, what? You know, given the courses that I've taken and the and the credits that I have, like, what am I closest to getting a major in?" And they were like, "Put it aside." <laughs> And I was like, great, let's do it. <laughs> and, that's, uh, that's pretty cool. But uh, I, um, and then that, so that junior year, I went and I worked on a campaign in Indiana. I, I spent, uh, which was actually kind of a, a uh, which was actually a pretty big decision, you know, to be a collegiate football player. And I did not spend, the summer before my junior season, I did not spend the whole summer in, in, in summer school. I, I was away for two months and that was like, a, you know, uh, that at that point in time, it was like a no, no. Now I don't think anyone can be off campus in the summertime in football, but at that point in time, it was still a big deal. And, um, and so I, I went and I worked on a campaign that summer and I really got to learn, you know, what, the rest of America looked like, what it meant to be a part of the political process, you know, and, you know, and I grew up in North Carolina, but I'd spend the time in, in Indiana and in Indiana, you know, even though North Carolina is a reddish state, it's more purple than Indiana, but, uh, but mm. Indiana was red at the time. And, uh, and I, and I thought it was interesting to see and to hear from people that look so different from me but in theory to communicate that their hopes and their vision and dreams for the, for the country and their communities, you know, really like steeped in the same things that were important in the community that I grew up in the South in the North side of Charlotte. And so, uh, and so that kind of like really grasped me in a way more so than any book or pamphlet or piece of legislation that I read during the time, it was really, you know, seeing and hearing people that I inherently thought to be significantly different from me, actually not seem that different from me in person. Wow. So this is why we do this. So we get some, some, some backstory on how you became who you are. Um, we'll go into your political career a little bit later, but everyone that's listening knows you work for President Obama. They may not know you left the White House in 2011 to go to business school. And not just business school, you went to Wharton, University of Pennsylvania in my hometown, Philadelphia. <laughs> but, but how do you tell the president, how do you tell the president, President Obama, that you're, you're leaving his staff to go back to school? Man, and let me tell you, the conversation with Barack Obama when you tell him that, uh, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to go to, uh, the university of Pennsylvania for business school. He said to me, you know, why would you go to Penn? He was like, it's far, it's hard. Like, why don't you go to GW? And I said to him, I said, well, you know, like Penn is supposedly one of the best business schools in the country. And he was like, yeah. And he said, it is. And I said, and I said, well, and you know, in Harvard, is in theory one of the best law schools in the country and that's where you went. And <laughs> and he said to me, he said, yeah, but I work for the president of the United States. <laughs> 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 and, 
And so uh, to to somehow assume that I had his, um, what's the word, full blessing and support on the process uh-huh. definitely was not the case. Um, but look, I, I think that, you know, Michelle and Barack are such people uh, who are who are firm believers in the value of education. And so, um, you know, I, I think when when I when I see him now, I mean, uh, he'll he'll still joke with me uh, about um, how he he doesn't think it was the right idea, but how things turned out OK for me anyway. <laughs> <laughs> But what made you, when you made a decision to, to leave President Obama, like, what were you thinking, yes, to go to school, but what did you want to do post getting your MBA that you had to make that decision, like, right then and there? Yeah, I mean, so I never thought that, um, I never thought that when I initially started business school that I would leave the White House. I was doing the executive program, so I was taking the train up on the weekends to, to Philly. Um, and so the decision that sort of got me to say, okay, you know what, I'm gonna leave the White House was that what I, what I found out after a year in the program was that I could not successfully complete business school and work at the White House at the same time. Uh, and my grades actually reflected that. and so. I had spent like $100,000 on the first year of business school. And I was like, in my mind, I was like, all right, I can't fail out. Um, And and then I'd say as a whole, I never, like the reason I wanted to go to business school had more to do with, um, you know, look, I think it's a couple things. I think one in the world of politics and policy, you know, you've got to have an MBA or you've got to have some sort of, graduate degree if you like want to have a, a seat at the table uh and then i would say from a professional point of view you know i never wanted to be in a scenario where i was working for a company or for an org and there was someone that worked for me and they were and their whole point was like the only reason you're here is because you work for barack obama you know like i wanted to to have my own credentialing and, and my own experiences that ultimately that would allow me to be you know, an effective manager and an effective leader, uh, with not only within a political organization, but, you know, any organization that I would end up in in the future. What you learned at Warden, you couldn't get from, from just moving and shaking in D.C.? I mean, look, I would say... Because you know, hold on one second, because you know, when you go to, like, I went to, I went to Virginia, and... Um, I got my degree in rhetoric and communication studies, right? Yeah. I ain't use none of that. <laughs> yeah. I, I didn't use any of that. Yeah. Well, but I mean, it is Wharton though, so you may Wharton may well, Wharton look, may prepare you a little bit better for you know where you were going. I mean, look, I I will say the content at Wharton is not you know it's not proprietary, right? Like you can learn the things that they're teaching other places. Um, will you be able to learn it as effectively? I, I don't know. I mean, what I will say, the thing that, the thing that you can't really underplay is really the impact that Wharton has in the world of financial services, right? I mean, they are kind of a leader in the space when you go down. I mean, in, even when you just look at sort of the folks who are like owners of teams now, right? All of these guys, the Witzer, Harris, <laughs> West Eden, I mean, they're all Wharton, Harvard, NBA people, right? Like, it's a, and look, and I, I would say that uh, I, I would do, I would do the same thing again. I, I, I think it was the right decision. I would say the thing that I've probably gotten the most out of it is that, um, you know, that I, being in that channel and in that flow and in that alumni group, you know, and I, it's the same at UVA. I mean, the UVA alumni network is super powerful. It's, it's, it's the same at Duke. Um, but, you know, I think it, it, there are some unique things about 
the University of Pennsylvania and, and the reach and the and the touch that they have across the, the world of financial services. So true. Now, now I'm, I'm just going to give you a little story about Duke. Like my, my sister was diagnosed with leukemia um, about a year and a half ago. And we, you know, I, I did all the studying. I just reached out. I cast a, a wide net to see where, you know, where should she go? Because she needed a bone marrow transplant. Where should she go? So I reached out to all these places, um, MD Anderson, Sloan. I mean, I talked, I called, I called Coach K. I got his phone number. Um, he got me in touch with some of the people there at Duke. And we finally decided that we use Duke services. Um, <laughs> and I, I say this to say, um, all the doctors that my sister saw at Duke, they said this line, we do things differently at Duke. <laughs> Right? I mean, I, it, it, it's such power. And you could probably say the same thing at Warden. We, we do things differently at Warden. And I, I do get it. I do get it. And I, you know, my sister's alive and kicking right now because of Duke doctors doing things differently. So I, I appreciate um, that line of work when people specialize in things and they really believe in what they do because of, of, of they're the best at it. And if you're the best at it, um, I, I entrusted my, my sister's life with the with the people well, that, at Duke who do who did things differently. That is so a real blessing. That, that's pretty cool. Real real blessing that that <laughs> she was able to, to 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 make it through that. That's such a hard process, and I can't I can't imagine uh, what it must be like to have been on on that on that side of it. And uh, you know, I, I hope that she's well. And where where is she at now? She's here. She's here in uh, Columbia, South oh, Carolina. Great. Well, uh, give, give her a hug for me yeah. and, and, and warm wishes. Sure will. Sure will. We're going to move on to uh, just politics. We, we, I want to know how, how you landed the job with uh, President Obama. Yeah, I mean, so, uh, look, I, um, so when I first uh, started working for then-Senator Obama, I worked as a staff assistant. And so um, if you're familiar with um sort of the structure of a of a senate office you know you've got all these important roles like chief of staff you know legislative <laughs> director chief policy director communications director you name it you name it and then all the way down at the bottom you got staff assistant and so i came in as a staff assistant uh when i was uh i was like about 23 years old i had just gotten uh cut from the Cowboys and they were like telling me they wanted me to go to NFL Europe. And I was like, I don't know if I want to go to NFL Europe. And that's how old I am. NFL Europe was still in existence. And, um, you know, and I got, well, wait a minute, you wait a minute, wait a minute, Reggie, the Cowboys did you a favor. I'm a Philadelphia Eagles fan. They, could, they did you a favor. So you, you it worked out well. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. All my, all my, all my friends from Duke are Eagles fans, man. They're, they're all <laughs> Gorys and Philly and Donovan McNabb years. Oh man. Uh, well, uh, and uh, yeah, so I moved to DC as a, as a staff assistant, and um, you know, during that process, um, what we had found out was that there was a bunch of mail that had been sent to Senator Obama before he was ever elected. It was like hidden in a closet. He had given this great speech in 2004 uh, at the DNC. He wasn't sworn in mm -hmm. until January of 05. And, uh, you know, so for like five months, like mail had been coming to the US Senate looking for Barack Obama. And uh, when I got uh, there, there was like a 8,000 piece backlog. And I was like three interns and an Adobe and a scanner from the basement. We basically uh, turned around a big mail backlog. And then we essentially came up with a process to digitize the mail system. And so we were like the first U.S. Senate office to have a digital mail process. And so Pete Rouse, who was the chief of staff at the time, was like, this is amazing. I can't believe it. It was like I turned water into wine. And I was like, well, it was like, Adobe and a scanner and there was an FTP site over here. <laughs> and so when um, when when Obama decided he was going to run for president and, and launch an exploratory, exploratory committee, um, 
uh, Pete said to me, why don't you go on the road and, and take care of stuff for the candidate? And so that was like my foray into being the body guy. And so, you know, I started showing up at the plane and like carrying, you know, trail mix and the Tide pin and an extra <laughs> shirt and, uh, <laughs> you know, the briefing book and all the stuff. Uh, and so that's kind of how it happened. And I think it was probably more like, um, what do they call it? Stockholm syndrome after two years of campaigning. <laughs> I think, uh, you know, uh, he, uh, neither one of us could get rid of one another. And so uh, he uh, asked me if I would come and uh, uh, do the same job for him as president. Uh, and so, you know, I, I didn't think that I would have because I was really tired after the campaign. But, uh, you know, when he asked me, I was like, oh, yes, yeah, sure. of course I'll do at least two years. <laughs> <laughs> you knew him before he became president. Like, did you feel the need to... Did you call him Barack before he became president? And then when he became president, did you did you change or did you have to well when someone's around you probably had to you had to greet him as as president, yes? No, always. Uh I mean I even in front of his friends though and if I didn't say Mr. President, I would at least say, you know, sir. Uh Okay. But never right. never refer to him as Hey Barack, just so you know. Just because I was not that cool. <laughs> I mean, it, it, it's it's a lot of. You did know, he mind? I, I think what, he, what did he prefer? I think he. I think with with people that he was really close with, I think he never wanted people to feel like they needed to treat him differently. You know, I think there was like this whole mm-hmm. like humanization part of it, and I would and I always would say to him, if he would say to me, "You don't have to call me sir, or Mr. President," I would say to him you know, it's about the office and like you're, you hold the office and like, I have to treat and respect the office the way that I would, you know, for anyone, irrespective of you or someone else, um, which mm. he let me, you know, cause I never wanted to give anyone the idea that, well, if Reggie calls him Brock, then everyone else can do it as well. <laughs> He's the president. I mean, I often, you know, I'm not really, political person. I do watch. I do listen. But for me, I I would take offense when somebody did not refer to him as president, when I hear so many other people refer to all the other presidents as president. So I, I took offense to it. So I just wanted to know, and you knew him prior to him becoming becoming the president. So that's cool. Respect in the, respect in the office. Um, Reggie, how did you find time to write a book? Uh, look, I, I, um, so during the campaign, I was technically like our quote unquote, uh, campaign photographer. Right. And so uh, you, you'll, you probably remember this in which there, there became this point in time in which everyone now had a phone on their camera and, and it wasn't like the iPhone, right? It was like before the iPhone was a thing, it was like, <laughs> people were still using like the razor and like the Motorola <laughs> thing and, uh, and so the sidekick. The sidekick. And, uh, and so, um, so I, I would carry a camera with me so that if anyone ever wanted to take a photo, uh, the candidate would then say, yeah, well, I'm happy to take a quick photo here. Reggie will take it and he'll send it to you. And so I took pictures every day for, for two consecutive years, uh, during the campaign. And so I, and in order to like, to, to catalog, in order to find the photos, I had to like catalog them. So I would catalog photos every day for every stop that we ever went on. And so that really was sort of the, the, the basis that kind of helped me sort of put together my thoughts, uh, when I, when I wrote the book and I, I didn't write it until, uh, until basically until my, until I got out of the business school. So the year I got, out of business school the year that I finished uh, um, uh, the, the draft to be sent to the publisher. So you, you share some stories in your memoir, Power Forward, My Presidential Education. But what is your absolute favorite memory from your time working with President Obama and, and or in the White House? Oh, man. Oh, I, I, it, there's so many great moments. Um, I think... I still love, 
you know, for me, and, and now that I'm a father myself, um, you know, uh, uh, the president at the time gives me a hard time. And the first day he's president of the United States, he's in the Oval Office and he comes into my office and he says, you know, look, we just, we went to a bunch of events yesterday. Uh, you know, and I might just be miss I might've missed it, but I feel like I did not see your parents yesterday. And I said, uh, oh, Mr. President, thank you so much. Like they're here. They had a great time. They went to blah, 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 blah. And, and he goes, Oh yeah. But just, I don't think I really got a chance to just to say, to see them and to say, thank you. And I said, look, Mr. President, this is the first day in the White House, like super busy. We just, and I'm like in the, I'm in a fight with my mom over like tickets. Like you probably have been here before when like your mom is like promising all your tickets to other people. And you're just like, mom, stop <laughs> promising my tickets away. And, and so, uh, so I say to the president, I said, look, you know, my mom and I were in a fight, like I'm going to see her out later. And he goes, he says, Oh, look, that's great. He goes, I'm the leader of the free world. He's like, I want your mom and dad to come by the Oval Office. And I go, <laughs> all right, great, we'll do it. And so, um, and so my mom and my dad, they come by, we figure out how to get them waved in through the security system. They come by, they say hello. The first lady stops by, they say hello. They stay for five minutes, they go out. 10 minutes later, the the president walks back through my office and then says to me, he goes, was that so hard? And I go, sir, like, you just don't understand. And he goes, <laughs> he goes, Reggie, you don't understand. It's like, your parents will not be here forever. You should never miss the opportunity to appreciate them and to show them gratitude and love. As, a, as someone who lost my mother at a, at an age that I was not ready for, like, I would never want you to have any regrets about not doing as much as you can while they're still here with you. And daring. I mean, that's it. You know, that's, that's, that's the president we all know and love. First day. First <laughs> the president we all know. First day. First day. President of the United States. First day. He had so many other things that he had to take care of, but he took that time and that moment to make you and your parents feel good. And that's, you know, that's, that's who he is. That's all. That's who we, you know, you know, take the policies, take whatever away. You know, he humanized um, his presidency, and I, you know, and, and I appreciate that. So thank you for for sharing for sharing that story. But can, can we talk about the the 50th birthday oh, yeah. basketball game at the at the White House? I mean, look, huh? that, that was I gotta say, how did that come together? <laughs> uh, so uh, it was, um, you know, so obviously there had been these basketball games that were happening in DC. So Arnie Duncan, who played at Harvard, uh, uh, John Rogers, I'm sorry, John Rice, who's Susan Rice's brother who played at Yale, a couple guys who played at Brown. Um, there were some younger guys uh, that played like D1, D2, like an Amherst guy, a guy from Babson. So we'd had these like, games going for you know for, for for years and then obama's friends from chicago like marty nesbitt and eric whitaker all these guys would talk about you know when i you know i got all this game and you know when i was young i used to be able to do x y and z <clears throat> and so uh <laughs> you know it was like one of these like uh you know sitting around playing cards and thinking about like okay uh we should like organize a game of all the people who are in the NBA that were supportive of the campaign. Right. And it was like Chauncey Billups and Chris Paul and, uh, uh, -huh. uh and, um, Joe Kim Noah and like all, of, you know, there's a whole host of people. And then we kind of like filled in around, all right, all the people were supportive. And then like, who are the people that weren't supportive or vocal, but we just really want to play ball with. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh that's that's, that's kind of how it came to be and uh you know it was a great opportunity you know we brought a bunch of wounded warriors down from uh uh from walter reed from Ra walter reed that day 
And, you know, it was just a great, and to be totally honest, and I tell people this all the time, you know who the best player there was? Who? Maya Moore. She was by far better than everybody. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Maya Moore. That's 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 pretty cool. We miss Maya. We miss Maya. But I know she's got uh she's doing some bigger things that's impacted more than just Maya. It's always the the selfless great ones that uh make the biggest impact. Uh they definitely do. They definitely um, do. And and I, I mm -hmm. appreciate her, her sacrifice too. Um you know, she's a she's mm -hmm. a she's a, a, a one of a kind person. She sure is. She sure is. We gonna move it along, and I, you know, I'm gracious of your time. But let's talk a little bit about DNI, diversity, equity, and inclusion. I mean, it's kind of a trendy topic these days, uh, but for you, it's more than uh, just a corporate buzzword. So, in your career, how are you emphasizing that? Yeah, I mean, look, I think um, obviously not a, not only for me and my firm, but a lot of the world in the last year and a half has now kind of come to, to terms with, you know, intentionality, right? Um, and and I often say that everyone will, will say, well, look, I didn't intend to do this and I intend to do this. And, and, and I always just say, like, you know, uh, measure your actions, you know, and don't just measure uh, the extraordinary actions, measure your ordinary actions, right? What are the things that you do that are like close to your home, that are close to your hoop, that are close to your community that you do uh, on, a, on a normal basis? And, and those things will pretty much dictate um, what your impact is. And so, and so for me, like at Apollo, and Apollo is a big global asset management firm. And um, you know, if if you if you study the trends on asset management, there's like seventy trillion dollars of assets under management here in the U.S. Basically, sixty nine trillion of them are managed by white men, uh, or are firms that are owned by white men. Apollo, we manage about uh, about six hundred billion. Uh, and, and I basically have said one of the biggest, um, drivers of the, of income inequality and the wealth gap between white and black, I, I do believe is the, dis the, the increasing disparity of black capital allocators, um, in, in America. And I, I think that like, Ultimately, you know, all the institutions that I that I touch, Penn, Duke, Apollo, I always say, okay, what are we doing with diverse managers? What are we doing with uh, diverse suppliers? Like, what what does the ecosystem of the people we touch look like? And and then once we've like measured it and assessed it. Then, then we say, are are we okay with that? And, and I will, you know, and I, I will highlight Duke because Duke I love and I love to pick on Duke, even though I'm not picking on him. But um, they, their endowment, you know, is almost between the Duke endowment and the hospital. They manage twenty billion. When when we started this conversation with them, the uh, uh, a year, a little bit over a year ago, they had less than um, they had twenty billion of a twenty billion. $20 billion, 270 managers to manage the $20 billion. They had one black manager out of 270. One. One black owned manager. Now they've grown it to almost six and they've grown it to almost a billion with diverse managers. But like, in my mind, like they're paying a billion dollars in fees a year. Fees. fees like not like oh like carry like just fees and like and in my mind like i look at it this way and people tell me that you know if you talk to folks about um what's wrong in the community asset management isn't like one of the problems 
But what I know is this, is that when Robert Smith gives money away, right, and he's the, one of the largest black asset managers in the, in the mm-hmm. world, how many synagogues does Robert Smith give money to? Zero. And so if we want to really, if our community, if we want to like figure out a way to like create a massive amount of impact across our community, like ultimately, like our, we've got to be able to create more diversity and wealth creation amongst the African-American community, especially in the world of financial services. Um, and so that's what I've, I've been focused on. Apollo, we've launched a couple partnerships. There's a great woman, Sharice Clark Soros, who launched a platform called Harborview. Um, she's focused on music royalties. Um, you know, I think we supported her with, you know, almost a billion dollars of, of a combination of debt and equity. And I think she'll be, you know, I think she'll be one of the next great uh, black female owned asset managers in, in, in the country. All right, just the last thing we're going to do, we're going to have a little bit of fun. Because uh, uh, I appreciate your time, and I know you're a busy man, but just just one more thing of fun. We're gonna we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna put twenty seconds on the shot on on the clock. Twenty seconds, quick quick answers. Okay, yeah. basketball, football. Watch football, play basketball. LeBron, of, <laughs> LeBron or Jordan. LeBron. Ooh. Perk from the White House, you missed the most. Oh, Air Force One. Easy. Oh my God. That's my dream. Like that's my dream. Mm-hmm. Like I gotta I gotta model Air Force One. I watch movies on Air Force One. I didn't know they had the the limousine that if it if if one of the limousines that's carrying the president, if the tire is flattened by something, it a new tire comes on it. <laughs> like I don't, how, what kind of technology is that? Like I, I read that, I watch it all. Sorry about that. I just had a little, I just had a little moment. Can you do more push-ups than Michelle Obama? Uh, yeah. I, I, I mean, look, I don't know. I think so. I don't know what her count is. <laughs> I, I think I can do. Uh, 60 consecutive right now. But I don't know. She might. I don't know. We'll see. We might have to. <laughs> um, what superpower would you have liked to have? Man, you know, I just always wanted to be 6'10". You know, my I I was told at a young age I was going to be <laughs> 6'10", and I only got to be 6'4 and a half. And it was, it's still one of the things I'm most sad about. <laughs> All right. What song or artist are you most proud of you introduced President Obama to? Oh, Jay-Z. Easy. Oh, really? You introduced him to Jay-Z? I mean, basically, the story is, before he went to go meet with Jay-Z and Beyonce, he was like, you know what, I should listen to some of his songs. And I was like, and he was like, can you give me five songs I should listen to before I, I was like, I was like, only five? Like, I don't know, man. You probably need like 15. <laughs> <laughs> okay, how about this? Yourself as a writer or Allison Glock? Allison Glock is a way better writer than I am. Way better writer. <laughs> <laughs> Love Allison Glock. <laughs> okay, last question. If you didn't go to Duke, where would you have gone to school? I can't say this publicly. Oh. <laughs> oh. I know. The Tar Heels? I'm, I just can't say it publicly. <laughs> oh, okay. 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 I got you. <laughs> okay. Well, on this podcast, I'm talking leadership, disruptors, change makers, it's hoops, it's politics, it's pop culture. It's the net sum of life. So, before I let you go, I ask all my guests for some words of wisdom that either they received, that helps guide them, or that they want to pass along to others. Reggie, what are your words of wisdom that you want to share? Yeah, I think uh, in terms of for people who are on their journey, 
you know, uh, life is, is not always linear. Um, and ultimately, uh, the fruit from your labor may not always bear the moment you want, uh, want it to bear. And so, you know, don't let a nonlinear, uh, 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 non-fruitful season deter you from continuing to, um, to, to invest in yourself and to invest in your, in your dreams and your goals and, and to continue to put in the work. Um, and, and then I would say, uh, for advice, um, you know, there, there, there are no stupid questions. Um, I, I think oftentimes as, as a, as a athlete, as a, what I, I appeared, I thought I was like a, you know, a top athlete, uh, when I was coming up in college and, I always felt like I had to sort of be like at the top of everything. And, you know, when it comes down to it, there are a lot of things that I was, I was uninformed about and, and that's okay. Uh, and I think it's okay to be um, uninformed. Um, it's okay to be vulnerable about those things because those are really the only places in which you grow. And, and, and when you evolve, if, if you're able to, to let your, your vulnerabilities come out and, and if you can express them. Uh, and I think that, um, you know, life is, is too short to feel like we, we've got all the solutions uh, that we need for, for this entire journey. Well said. Well, well thanks, Reggie. Appreciate you coming, and, coming on the, and Don, the I got, podcast. I got a question for you, though, Don. Uh, what, what, what's the number one okay. thing you were teaching your, 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 your team when they come in? What, what's, what's the one thing you want every athlete that comes to your program to take away from from your process um th this is my one of my life models and that is the disciplined person can do anything so whatever whatever they 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 take away from our program and experiencing us as a coaching staff um and they leave our program, they're disciplined. They're, they're just disciplined people, and they will find their way into success, whether it's through basketball, whether it's through any other profession. And I, I hope I hope as a coach that I was able to, to, help, to help in that area because that is the very thing that I utilize to, you know, to sit where I sit. All right. I like it. Discipline. I believe in it. Yep. Discipline. Discipline. Do, Reggie, before we leave, do you have anything you want to plug or promote? No, well, look, I, I just want to say thank you for having me on. And, you know, uh, uh, everyone who, who's listening, uh, make sure that uh, uh, you guys are all getting registered to vote, uh, participating in your political process, not just your state, not just your Senate races and presidential races, but all your local races, your county commissioners, your mayors, your city councils, because all, all these things matter. Um, all these uh, officials are determining so many important elements of what is happening in your community. Uh, you know, stay educated, express your voice, uh, and, and always believe that, uh, that your voice matters, no matter, no, no matter what issue it is. The end. Well said, Reggie. Thank you so much. No, thank you. And thank you all so much for listening. Don't forget to follow NetLife with Dawn Staley on Apple Podcasts. Uh, subscribe on Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts. NetLife is produced by Just Women Sports. For more great sports content, go to JustWomenSports.com. Be sure to subscribe to the newsletter and YouTube channel and follow along on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok. And this is Dawn Staley signing off and look forward to uh, having some great conversations. Before you see their scores, hear their stories. On the Flame Bearers podcast, top women identifying athletes from around the world share their trials, triumphs, and full selves. With the Beijing Winter Paralympics underway, Flame Bearers' second season is live now and highlighting stories from U.S. figure skater Brady Tennell, ROC's Oksana Abdekarmanmova, and many more. 
Get ready for the Beijing games and listen to Flame Bearers wherever you get your podcasts.